Chapter 8, Part 4 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 8, Proper Names in America, Part 4. Street Names. Such a locality as the corner of Avenue H and 23rd Street, says W. W. Crane, is about as distinctively American as Algonquin and Iroquois names like Mississippi and Saratoga. Kipling, in his American Notes, gives testimony to the strangeness with which the number names, the phrase the corner of, and the custom of omitting street fall upon the ear of a Britisher. He quotes with amazement certain directions given to him on his arrival in San Francisco from India. Go six blocks north to the corner of Geary and Markey. Market. Then walk around till you strike the corner of Gutter and 16th. The English always add the word street or road or place or avenue when speaking of a thoroughfare. Such a phrase as Oxford and New Bond would strike them as incongruous. The American custom of numbering and lettering streets is almost always ascribed by English writers who discuss it, not to a desire to make finding them easy, but to sheer poverty of invention. The English apparently have an inexhaustible fund of names for streets. They often give one street more than one name. Thus, Oxford Street... London, becomes the Bayswater Road, High Street, Holland Park Avenue, Goldhawk Road, and finally the Oxford Road to the Westward, and High Holborn, Holborn Viaduct, Newgate Street, Cheapside, The Poultry, Cornhill, and Leadenhall Street to the eastward. The Strand in the same way becomes Fleet Street, Ludgate Hill, and Cannon Street. Nevertheless, there is a First Avenue in Queen's Park, and parallel to it are Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Avenues, all small streets leading northward from the Harrow Road, just east of Kensal Green Cemetery. I have observed that few Londoners have ever heard of them. There is also a First Street in Chelsea, a very modest thoroughfare near Lennox Gardens and not far from the Brompton Oratory. Next to the numbering and lettering of streets, a fashion apparently set up by Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant's plans for Washington, the most noticeable feature of American street nomenclature, as opposed to that of England, is the extensive use of such designations as Avenue, Boulevard, Drive, and Speedway. Avenue is used in England, but only rather sparingly. It is seldom applied to a mean street, or to one in a warehouse district. In America, the word is scarcely distinguished in meaning from street. Footnote. There are, of course, local exceptions. In Baltimore, for example, Avenue used to be reserved for wide streets in the suburbs. Thus, Charles Street, on passing the old city boundary, became Charles Street Avenue. Further out, it became the Charles Street Avenue Road, probably a unique triplication. But that was years ago. Of late, many fifth-rate streets in Baltimore have been changed into avenues. End footnote. Boulevard, drive, and speedway are almost unknown to the English. But they use road for urban thoroughfares, which is very seldom done in America, and they also make free use of place, walk, passage, lane, and circus, all of which are obsolescent on this side of the ocean. Some of the older American cities, such as Boston and Baltimore, have surviving certain ancient English designations of streets. Example, Cheapside and Cornhill. These are unknown in the newer American towns. Broadway, which is also English, is more common. Many American towns now have plazas, which are unknown in England. 
nearly all have city hall parks, squares, or places. City hall is also unknown over there. The principal street of a small town in America is almost always Main Street. In England, it is as invariably High Street, usually with the definite article before High. I have mentioned the corruption of old Dutch street and neighborhood names in New York. Spanish names are corrupted in the same way in the Southwest and French names in the Great Lakes region and in Louisiana. In New Orleans, the street names, many of them strikingly beautiful, are pronounced so barbarously by the people that a Frenchman would have difficulty recognizing them. Thus, Bourbon has become Bourbon. Dauphin is Dauphin. Foucher is Foucher. Enguin is Enguin. And Felicity, originally Felicité, is fill a city. The French in their days bestowed the names of the muses upon certain of the city streets. They are now pronounced Calliope, Terpsichore, Melpomene, Euterp, and so on. Bon enfant, apparently too difficult for the native, has been translated into good children. Only Esplanade and Bagatelle among the French street names of the city, seem to be commonly pronounced with any approach to correctness. End of chapter 8, part 4. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 9, part 1 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 9, Miscellanea, Part 1. Proverb and Platitude. No people, save perhaps the Spaniards, have a richer store of proverbial wisdom than the Americans, and surely none other make more diligent and deliberate efforts to augment its riches. The American literature of inspirational platitude is enormous and almost unique. There are half a dozen authors, e.g. Dr. Orison Sweat Marden and Dr. Frank Crane, who devote themselves exclusively and to vast profit to the composition of arresting and uplifting apothems, and the fruits of their fancy are not only sold in books, but also displayed upon an infinite variety of calendars, banners, and wall cards. It is rarely that one enters the office of an American businessman without encountering at least one of these wall cards. It may, on the one hand, show nothing save a succinct caution that time is money, say, do it now, or this is my busy day. On the other hand, it may embody a long and complex sentiment ornately set forth. The taste for such canned sagacity seems to have arisen in America at a very early day. Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, begun in 1732, remained a great success for 25 years, and the annual sales reached 10,000. It had many imitators and founded an aphoristic style of writing which culminated in the essays of Emerson, often mere strings of sonorous certainties, defectively articulated. The proverbial philosophy of Martin Faker Tupper dawning upon the American public in the early 40s, was welcomed with enthusiasm. As Saintsbury says, its success on this side of the Atlantic even exceeded its success on the other. But that was the last and perhaps the only importation of the sage and mellifluous in bulk. In late years, the American production of such merchandise has grown so large that the balance of trade now flows in the other direction. Visiting Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, France, and Spain in the spring of 1917, I found translations of the chief works of Dr. Marden on sale in all those countries, and with them the masterpieces of such other apostles of the new thought as Ralph Waldo Trine and Elizabeth Town. No other American books were half so well displayed. The note of all such literature, and of the maxims that precipitate themselves from it, 
is optimism they inspire by voicing and revoicing the new thought doctrine that all things are possible to the man who thinks the right sort of thoughts in the national phrase to the right thinker this right thinker is indistinguishable from the forward looker whose belief in the continuity and benignity of the evolutionary process takes on the virulence of a religious faith out of his confidence come the innumerable saws axioms and gelfu gelfli worte it is the national arsenal ranging from the it won't hurt none to try to the great masses of the plain people to such exhilarating confections of the wall card virtuosi as the elevator to success is not running take the stairs naturally enough a grotesque humor plays about this literature of hope the folk though it moves them prefer it with a dash of salt smile damn you smile is a typical specimen of this seasoned optimism many examples of it go back to the early part of the last century for instance don't monkey with the buzz saw and it will never get well if you pick it others are patently modern e g the lord is my shepherd i should worry and roll over you're on my back the national talent for extravagant and pungent humor is well displayed in many of these maxims it would be difficult to match in any other folk literature such examples as i'd rather have them say there he goes than here he lies or don't spit remember the johnstown flood or shoot it in the arm your legs full or cheer up there ain't no hell or if you want to cure homesickness go back home many very popular phrases and proverbs are borrowings from above few die and none resign originated with thomas jefferson bret hart i believe was the author of no checky no shirty general w t sherman is commonly credited with war as hell and mark twain with life is one damned thing after another an elaborate and highly characteristic proverb of the uplifting variety so live that you can look any man in the eye and tell him to go to hell was first given currency by one of the engineers of the panama canal a gentleman later retired it would seem for attempting to execute his own counsel from humor the transition to cynicism is easy and so many of the current sayings are at war with the optimism of the majority kick him again he's down is a depressing example what's the use a rough translation of the latin qui bono is another the same spirit is visible in tell your troubles to a policeman how'd you like to be the iceman some say she do and some say she don't nobody loves a fat man i love my wife but oh you kid and would you for fifty cents the last originated in the ingenious mind of an advertisement writer and was immediately adopted in the course of time it acquired naughty significance and helped to give a start to the amazing button craze of ten or twelve years ago the saturnalia of proverb and phrase which finally aroused the guardians of the public morals and was put down by the police that neglect which marks the study of the vulgate generally extends to the subject of popular proverb making the english publisher frank palmer prints an excellent series of little volumes presenting the favorite proverbs of all civilized races including the chinese and japanese and there is no american volume among them even such exhaustive collections as that of robert christie contain no american specimens not even don't monkey with the buzz saw or root hog and die end of chapter nine part one Chapter 9, Part 2 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 9, Miscellanea, Part 2, American Slang this neglect of the national proverbial philosophy extends to the national slang there is but one work so far as i can discover formally devoted to it and that work is extremely superficial moreover it has been long out of date and hence is of little save historical value 
there are at least a dozen careful treatises on french slang half as many on english slang and a good many on german slang but american slang which is probably quite as rich as that of france and a good deal richer than that of any other country is yet to be studied at length nor is there much discussion of it of any interest or value in the general philological literature fowler and all the other early native students of the language dismissed it with lofty gestures down to the time of whitney it was scarcely regarded as a seemly subject for the notice of a man of learning lounsbury less pedantic viewed its phenomena more hospitably and even defined it as the source from which the decaying energies of speech are constantly refreshed and brander matthews following him has described its function as that of providing substitutes for the good words and true which are worn out by hard service but that is about as far as the investigation has got crap has some judicious paragraphs upon the matter in his modern english there are a few scattered essays upon the underlying psychology and various uninforming magazine articles but that is all the practicing authors of the country like its philologians have always shown a gingery and suspicious attitude the use of slang said oliver wendell holmes is at once a sign and a cause of mental atrophy slang said ambrose bierce fifty years later is the speech of him who robs the literary garbage carts on their way to the dumps literature in america as we have seen remains aloof from the vulgate despite the contrary examples of mark twain and howells all the more pretentious american authors try to write chastely and elegantly the typical literary product of the country is still a refined essay in the atlantic monthly perhaps gently jocose but never rough by emerson so to speak out of charles lamb the sort of thing one might look to be done by a somewhat advanced english curate george ade undoubtedly one of the most adept anatomists of the american character and painters of the american scene that the national literature has yet developed is neglected because his work is grounded firmly upon the national speech not that he reports it literally like lardner and the hacks trailing after lardner but that he gets at and exhibits its very essence it would stagger a candidate for a doctorate in philology i dare say to be told off by his professor to investigate the slang of aid in the way that bosson the swede has investigated that of jerome k jerome and yet until something of the sort is undertaken american philology will remain out of contact with the american language most of the existing discussions of slang spend themselves upon efforts to define it and in particular upon efforts to differentiate it from idiomatic neologisms of a more legitimate type this effort is largely in vain the borderline is too vague and wavering to be accurately mapped words and phrases are constantly crossing it and in both directions there was a time perhaps when the familiar american counter word proposition was slang its use seems to have originated in the world of business and it was soon afterward adopted by the sporting fraternity but to-day it is employed without much feeling that it needs apology and surely without any feeling that it is low nice as an adjective of all work was once in slang use only to-day no one would question a nice day or a nice time or a nice hotel awful seems to be going the same route awful sweet and awfully dear still seem slangy and schoolgirlish but awful children awful weather and an awful job have entirely sound support and no one save a pedant would hesitate to use them such insidious purifications and consecrations of slang are going on under our noses all the time the use of some as a general adjective adverb seems likely to make its way in the same manner it is constantly forgotten by purists of defective philological equipment that a great many of our most respectable words and phrases originated in the plainest sort of slang thus quandary 
despite a fanciful etymology which would identify it with wandreth equals evil is probably simply a composition form of the french phrase qu'on dirige again to turn to french itself there is tete a sound name for the human head for many centuries though its origin was in the latin testa equals pot a favorite slang word of the soldiers of the decaying empire analogous to our own block nut and conch the word slacker recently come into good usage in the united states as a designation for an unsuccessful shirker of conscription is a substantive derived from the english verb to slack which was born as university slang and remains so to this day brander matthews so recently as nineteen hundred and one thought to hold up slang it is now perfectly good american the contrary movement of words from the legitimate vocabulary into slang is constantly witnessed someone devises a new and intriguing trope or makes use of an old one under circumstances arresting the public attention and at once it is adopted into slang given a host of remote significances and ding-donged ad nauseum the rooseveltian phrases muckraker ananias club short and ugly word nature faker and big stick offer examples not one of them was new and not one of them was of much pungency but roosevelt's vast talent for delighting the yokelry threw about them a charming air and so they entered into current slang and were mouthed idiotically for months another example is to be found in steamroller it was first heard of in june nineteen hundred and eight when it was applied by oswald f chouette of the chicago interocean to the methods employed by the roosevelt taft majority in the republican national committee in overriding the protests against seating taft delegates from alabama and arkansas at once it struck the popular fancy and was soon heard on all sides all the usual derivatives appeared to steamroller steamrollered and so on since then curiously enough the term has gradually forced its way back from slang to good usage and even gone over to england in the early days of the great war it actually appeared in the most solemn english reviews and once or twice i believe in state papers much of the discussion of slang by popular etymologists is devoted to proofs that this or that locution is not really slang at all that it is to be found in shakespeare in milton or in the revised version these scientists of course overlook the plain fact that slang like the folk song is not the creation of people in the mass but of definite individuals and that its character as slang depends entirely upon its adoption by the ignorant who use its novelties too assiduously and with too little imagination and so debase them to the estate of worn-out coins smooth and valueless it is this error often shared by philologists of sounder information that lies under the doctrine that the plays of shakespeare are full of slang and that the bard showed but a feeble taste in language nothing could be more absurd the business of writing english in his day was unharassed by the proscriptions of purists and so the vocabulary could be enriched more facilely than to-day but though shakespeare and his fellow dramatists quickly adopted such neologisms as to bustle to huddle bump hubbub and pat it goes without saying that they exercised a sound discretion and that the slang of the bank side was full of words and phrases which they were never tempted to use in our own day the same discrimination is exercised by all writers of sound taste on the one hand they disregard the senseless prohibitions of schoolmasters and on the other hand they draw the line with more or less watchfulness according as they are of conservative or liberal habit i find the best of the bunch and joke smith in saintsbury one could scarcely imagine either in walter pater but by the same token one could not imagine chicken for young girl abernet 
to come across or to camouflage in Saintsbury. Footnotes. Curiously enough, the American language, usually so fertile in words to express shades of meaning, has no respectable synonym for chicken. In English, there is flapper. In French, there is ingenu. And in German, there is backfisch. Usually, either the English or the French word is borrowed. End of footnote what slang actually consists of doesn't depend in truth upon intrinsic qualities but upon the surrounding circumstances it is the user that determines the matter and particularly the user's habitual way of thinking if he chooses words carefully with a full understanding of their meaning and savour then no word that he uses seriously will belong to slang but if his speech is made up chiefly of terms pole parroted and he has no sense of their shades and limitations, then slang will bulk largely in his vocabulary. In its origin, it is nearly always respectable. It is devised not by the stupid populace, but by individuals of wit and ingenuity. As Whitney says, it is the product of an exuberance of mental activity and the natural delight of language-making. But when its inventions happen to strike the popular fancy, and are adopted by the mob, they are soon worn threadbare, and so lose all piquancy and significance, and, in Whitney's words, become incapable of expressing anything that is real. This is the history of such slang phrases, often interrogative, as, How'd you like to be the ice man? How's your poor feet? Merci pour la langouste have a heart this is the life where did you get that hat would you for fifty cents let her go gallagher shoe fly don't bother me don't wake him up and let george do it the last well exhibits the process it originated in france as laissez faire à georges during the fifteenth century and at the start had satirical reference to the multiform activities of cardinal georges d'amboise prime minister to louis the twelfth footnote another american popular saying once embodied in a coon song may be traced to a sentence in the prayer of the old dessauer before the battle of kesseldorf december fifteenth seventeen forty five or if thou wilt not help me don't help those hunt fugte End of footnote it later became common slang was translated into english had a revival during the early days of david lloyd george's meteoric career was adopted into american without any comprehension of either its first or its latest significance and enjoyed the brief popularity of a year crap attempts to distinguish between slang and sound idiom by setting up the doctrine that the former is more expressive than the situation demands it is he says a kind of hyperesthesia in the use of language to laugh in your sleeve is idiom because it arises out of a natural situation it is a metaphor derived from the picture of one raising his sleeve to his face to hide a smile a metaphor which arose naturally enough in early periods when sleeves were long and flowing but to talk through your hat is slang not only because it is new but also because it is a grotesque exaggeration of the truth the theory unluckily is combated by many plain facts to hand it to him to get away with it and even to hand him a lemon are certainly not metaphors that transcend the practicable and probable and yet all are undoubtedly slang on the other hand there is palpable exaggeration in such phrases as he is not worth the powder it would take to kill him in such adjectives as breakbone fever and in such compounds as fire-eater and yet it would be absurd to dismiss them as slang between blockhead and bonehead there is little to choose but the former is sound english whereas the latter is american slang so with many familiar similes for example like greased lightning as scarce as hen's teeth they are grotesque hyperboles but surely not slang 
the true distinction between slang and more seemly idiom in so far as any distinction exists at all is that indicated by whitney slang originates in an effort always by ingenious individuals to make the language more vivid and expressive when in the form of single words it may appear as new metaphors for example bird and peach as back formations for example butte and flue as composition forms for example what do you call em? as picturesque compounds for example booze foundry as onomatopes for example biff and zowie or in any other of the shapes that new terms take if by the chances that condition language making it acquires a special and limited meaning not served by any existing locution it enters into sound idiom and is presently wholly legitimized if on the contrary it is adopted by the populace as a counter word and employed with such banal imitativeness that it soon loses any definite significance whatever then it remains slang and is avoided by the finical an example of the former process is afforded by tommy rot it first appeared as english schoolboy slang but its obvious utility soon brought it into good usage in one of jerome k jerome's books paul kelver there is the following dialogue the wonderful songs that nobody ever sings the wonderful pictures that nobody ever paints and all the rest of it it's tommy rot i wish you wouldn't use slang well you know what i mean what is the proper word give it to me i suppose you mean can't no i don't can't is something that you don't believe in yourself it's tommy rot there isn't any other word nor was there any other word for hubbub and to dwindle in shakespeare's time he adopted and dignified them because they met genuine needs nor was there any other satisfactory word for graft when it came in nor for rowdy nor for boom nor for joyride nor for omnibus bill nor for slacker nor for trust buster such words often retain a humorous quality they are used satirically and hence appear but seldom in wholly serious discourse but they have standing in the language nevertheless and only a prig would hesitate to use them as saintsbury used the best of the bunch and jokesmith on the other hand many an apt and ingenious neologism by falling too quickly into the gaping maw of the proletariat is spoiled forthwith once it becomes in oliver wendell holmes phrase a cheap generic term a substitute for differentiated specific expressions it quickly acquires such flatness that the fastidious flee it as a plague one recalls many capital verb phrases thus ruined by unintelligent appreciation for example to hand him a lemon to freeze on to to have the goods to fall for it and to get by one recalls too some excellent substantives for example dope and dub and compounds for example come on and easy mark and verbs for example to vamp these are all quite as sound in structure as the great majority of our most familiar words but their adoption by the ignorant and their endless use and misuse in all sorts of situations have left them tattered and obnoxious and they will probably go the way as matthew says of all the other temporary phrases which spring up one scarcely knows how and flourish unaccountably for a few months and then disappear forever leaving no sign matthews is wrong in two particulars here they do not arise by any mysterious parthenogenesis but come from sources which in many cases may be determined and they last alas a good deal more than a month shoe fly afflicted the american people for at least two years and i don't think and abernit quite as long even good night lasted a whole year a very large part of our current slang is propagated by the newspapers and much of it is invented by newspaper writers one needs but turn to the slang of baseball to find numerous examples 
such phrases as to clout the sphere the initial sack to slam the pill and the dexter meadow are obviously not of bleachers manufacture there is not enough imagination in that depressing army to devise such things more often than not there is not even enough intelligence to comprehend them the true place of their origin is the perch of the newspaper reporters whose competence and compensation is largely estimated at least on papers of wide circulation by their capacity for inventing novelties the supply is so large that connoisseurship has grown up an extra fecund slang maker on the press has his following during the summer of nineteen thirteen the chicago record herald somewhat alarmed by the extravagant fancy of its baseball reporters asked its readers if they would prefer a return to plain english such of them as were literate enough to send in their votes were almost unanimously against a change as one of them said one is nearer the park when schulte slams the pill than when he merely hits the ball in all other fields the newspapers originate and propagate slang particularly in politics most of our political slang terms since the civil war from pork barrel to steamroller have been their inventions the english newspapers with the exception of a few anomalies such as the pink un lean in the other direction their fault is not slanginess but an otiose ponderosity in dean alford's words the insisting on calling common things by uncommon names changing our ordinary short saxon nouns and verbs for long words derived from the latin the american newspapers years ago passed through such a stage of bombast but since the invention of yellow journalism by the elder james gordon bennett that is the invention of journalism for the frankly ignorant and vulgar they have gone to the other extreme edmund clarence stedman noted the change soon after the civil war the whole country he wrote to bayard taylor in eighteen seventy three owing to the contagion of our newspaper exchange system is flooded deluged swamped beneath a muddy tide of slang a thousand alarmed watchmen have sought to stay it since but in vain the great majority of our newspapers including all those of large circulation are chiefly written as one observer says not in english but in the strange jargon of words that would have made addison or milton shudder in despair end of chapter nine part two chapter nine part three of the american language this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 9. Miscellanea. Part 3. The Future of the Language. The Great Jacob Grimm, the founder of comparative philology, hazarded the guess more than three-quarters of a century ago that English would one day become the chief language of the world, and perhaps crowd out several of the then principal idioms altogether. In wealth, wisdom, and strict economy, he said, none of the other living languages can vie with it. At that time the guess was bold, for English was still in fifth place with not only French and German ahead of it, but also Spanish and Russian. In 1801, according to Michael George Mulhall, the relative standing of the five in the number of persons using them was as follows. French, 31,450,000. Russian, 30,770,000. German, 30,320,000. Spanish, 26,190,000. English, 20,520,000. The population of the United States was then but little more than 5 million. But in 20 years, it had nearly doubled, and thereafter it increased steadily and enormously. And by 1860, it was greater than that of the United Kingdom. 
Since that time, the majority of English-speaking persons in the world have lived on this side of the water. Today there are nearly three times as many as in the United Kingdom, and nearly twice as many as in the whole British Empire. This great increase in the American population, beginning with the great immigrations of the 30s and 40s, quickly lifted English to fourth place among the languages, and then to third, to second, and to first. When it took the lead, the attention of philologists was actively directed to the matter, and in 1868, one of them, a German named Brackebusch, first seriously raised the question whether English was destined to obliterate certain of the older tongues. Footnote. Long before this, the general question of the relative superiority of various languages had been debated in Germany. In 1796, the Berlin Academy offered a prize for the best essay on the ideal of a perfect language. It was won by one Jenisch, with a treatise bearing the sonorous title of A Philosophico-Critical Comparison and Estimate of Fourteen of the Ancient and Modern Languages of Europe, that is, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, German, Dutch, English, Danish, Swedish, Polish, Russian, and Lithuanian. End footnote. Brackebush decided against, on various philological grounds, none of them sound. His own figures, as the following table from his dissertation shows, were against him. English, 60 million. German, 52 million. Russian, 45 million. French, 45 million. Spanish, 40 million. This in 1868. Before another generation had passed, the lead of English, still because of the great growth of the United States, was yet more impressive, as the following figures for 1890 show. English, 111,100,000. German, 75,200,000. Russian, 75,000,000. French, 51,200,000. Spanish, 42,800,000. Italian, 33,400,000, Portuguese, 13 million. Today the figures exceed even these. They show that English is now spoken by two and a half times as many persons as spoke it at the close of the American Civil War, and by nearly eight times as many as spoke it at the beginning of the 19th century. No other language has spread in any such proportions. Even German, which is next on the list, shows but a fourfold gain since 1801, or just half that of English. The number of persons speaking Russian, despite the vast extension of the Russian Empire during the last century of the Tsars, has little more than tripled, and the number speaking French has less than doubled. But here are the figures for 1911. English. 160 million, German, 130 million, Russian, 100 million, French, 70 million, Spanish, 50 million, Italian, 50 million, Portuguese, 25 million. Japanese, perhaps, should follow French. It is spoken by 60 million persons. But Chinese may be disregarded, for it is split into half a dozen mutually unintelligible dialects and shows no sign of spreading beyond the limits of China. The same may be said of Hindustani, which is the language of 100 million inhabitants of British India. It shows wide dialectical variations, and the people who speak it are not likely to spread. But English is the possession of a race that is still pushing in all directions, and wherever that race settles, the existing languages tend to succumb. Thus, French, despite the passionate resistance of the French Canadians, is gradually decaying in Canada. In all the newly settled regions, English is universal. And thus, Spanish is dying out in our own southwest, and promises to meet with severe competition in some of the nearer parts of Latin America. 
the english control of the sea has likewise carried the language into far places there is scarcely a merchant ship captain on deep water of whatever nationality who does not find some acquaintance with it necessary and it has become in debased forms the lingua franca of oceanica and the far east generally three-fourths of the world's male matter says e h babbitt is now addressed in english and more than half of the world's newspapers are printed in english footnote babbitt predicts that by the year two thousand english will be spoken by one billion one hundred million persons as against five hundred million speakers of russian three hundred million of spanish one hundred and sixty million of german and sixty million of french End footnote brackabush in the speculative paper just mentioned came to the conclusion that the future domination of english would be prevented by its unphonetic spelling its grammatical decay and the general difficulties that a foreigner encounters in seeking to master it the simplification of its grammar he said is the commencement of dissolution the beginning of the end and its extraordinary tendency to degenerate into slang of every kind is the foreshadowing of its approaching dismemberment but in the same breath he was forced to admit that the greater development it has obtained was the result of this very simplification of grammar and an inspection of the rest of his reasoning quickly shows its unsoundness even without an appeal to the plain facts the spelling of a language whether it be phonetic or not has little to do with its spread very few men learn it by studying books they learn it by hearing it spoken as for grammatical decay it is not a sign of dissolution but a sign of active life and constantly renewed strength to the professional philologist perhaps it may sometimes appear otherwise he is apt to estimate languages by looking at their complexity the greek aorist elicits his admiration because it presents enormous difficulties and is inordinately subtle but the object of language is not to amuse grammarians but to convey ideas and the more simply it accomplishes that object the more effectively it meets the needs of an energetic and practical people and the larger its inherent vitality the history of every language of europe since the earliest days of which we have record is a history of simplifications even such languages as German, which still cling to a great many exasperating inflections, including the absurd inflection of the article for gender, are less highly inflected than they used to be, and are proceeding slowly but surely toward analysis. The fact that English has gone further along that road than any other civilized tongue is not a proof of its decrepitude, but a proof of its continued strength brought into free competition with another language say german or french or spanish it is almost certain to prevail if only because it is vastly easier that is as a spoken language to learn the foreigner essaying it indeed finds his chief difficulty not in mastering its forms but in grasping its lack of forms he doesn't have to learn a new and complex grammar. What he has to do is to forget grammar. Once he has done so, the rest is a mere matter of acquiring a vocabulary. He can make himself understood given a few nouns, pronouns, verbs, and numerals, without troubling himself in the slightest about accidents. Me, see, she is bad english perhaps but it would be absurd to say that it is obscure and on some not too distant tomorrow it may be very fair american essaying in inflected language the beginner must go into the matter far more deeply before he may hope to be understood bradley in the making of english 
shows clearly how German and English differ in this respect, and how great is the advantage of English. In the latter, the verb sing has but eight forms, and of these, three are entirely obsolete, one is obsolescent, and two more may be dropped out without damage to comprehension. In German, the corresponding verb singen has no less than sixteen forms. How far English has proceeded toward the complete obliteration of inflections is shown by such barbarous forms of it as Pigeon English and Beach Lamar, in which the final step is taken without appreciable loss of clarity. The Pigeon English verb is identical in all tenses. Go stands for both went and gone. Makey is both make and made. In the same way, there is no declension of the pronoun for case. My is thus I, me, mine, and our own, my. No belong my is, it is not mine. A crude construction, of course, but still clearly intelligible. Chinamen learn pidgin English in a few months, and savages in the South Seas master Beach Lamar almost as quickly. And a white man, once he has accustomed himself to either, finds it strangely fluent and expressive. He cannot argue politics in it, nor dispute upon transubstantiation, but for all the business of every day it is perfectly satisfactory. As we have seen in chapters 5 and 6, the American dialect of English has gone further along the road thus opened ahead than the mother dialect, and is moving faster. For this reason, and because of the fact that it is already spoken by a far larger and more rapidly multiplying body of people than the latter, it seems to me very likely that it will determine the final form of the language. For the old control of English over American to be reasserted is now quite unthinkable. If the two dialects are not to drift apart entirely, English must follow in Americans' tracks. This yielding seems to have begun. The exchanges from American into English grow steadily larger and more important than the exchanges from English into American. John Richard Green, the historian, discerning the inevitable half a century ago, expressed the opinion, amazing and unpalatable then, that the Americans were already the main branch of the English people. It is not yet wholly true. A cultural timorousness yet shows itself. There is still a class which looks to England as the Romans, long looked to Greece. But it is not the class that is shaping the national language. It is not the class that is carrying it beyond the national borders. The Americanisms that flood the English of Canada are not borrowed from the dialects of New England loyalists and fashionable New Yorkers, but from the common speech that has its sources in the native and immigrant proletariat and that displays its gaudiest freightage in the newspapers. The impact of this flood is naturally most apparent in Canada, whose geographical proximity and common interests completely obliterate the effects of English political and social dominance. By an order in council, passed in 1890, the use of the redundant you in such words as honor and labor is official in Canada, but practically all the Canadian newspapers omit it. In the same way the American flat A has swept whole sections of the country, an American slang is everywhere used, and the American common speech prevails almost universally in the newer provinces. More remarkable is the influence that American has exerted upon the speech of Australia and upon the crude dialects of Oceanica and the Far East. One finds such obvious Americanisms as tomahawk, boss, bush, canoe, go finish, 
meaning to die, and Pickaninny in Beach Lamar, and more of them in Pigeon English. And one observes a very large number of American words and phrases in the slang of Australia. The Australian common speech in pronunciation and intonation resembles Cockney English, and a great many Cockneyisms are in it. But, despite the small number of Americans in the Antipodes, it has adopted, of late, so many Americanisms that a Cockney visitor must often find it difficult. Among them are the verb and verb phrases to beef, to biff, to bluff, to boss, to break away, to chase one's self, to chew the rag, to chip in, to fade away, to get in the neck, to back and fill, to plug along, to get sore, to turn down and to get wise. The substantives, dope, boss, fake, creak, knockout drops, and push, in the sense of crowd. The adjectives, hitched, in the sense of married, and tough, as before luck. And the adverbial phrases, for keeps, and going strong. Here, in direct competition with English locutions, and with all the advantages on the side of the latter, American is making steady progress. This American language, says a recent observer, seems to be much more of a pusher than the English. For instance, after eight years' occupancy of the Philippines, it was spoken by 800,000 or 10% of the natives, while after an occupancy of 150 of India by the British, 3 million or 1% of the natives speak English. I do vouch for the figures. They may be inaccurate, in detail, but they at least state what seems to be a fact. Behind that fact are phenomena, which certainly deserve careful study, and above all, study divested of unintelligent prejudice. The attempt to make American uniform with English has failed ingloriously. The neglect of its investigation is an evidence of snobbishness that is a folly the same sort. It is useless to dismiss the growing peculiarities of the American vocabulary and of grammar and syntax in the common speech as vulgarisms beneath serious notice. Such vulgarisms have a way of entrenching themselves and gathering dignity as they grow familiar. There are but few forms in use, says Lounsbury, which, judged by a standard previously existing, would not be regarded as gross barbarisms. Each language, in such matters, is a law unto itself, and each vigorous dialect, particularly if it be spoken by millions, is a law no less. It would be as wrong, says Seiji, to use thou for the nominative the in the Somersetshire dialect, as it is to say the art instead of you are in the Queen's English. All the American dialect needs, in the long run, to make even pedagogues acutely aware of it, is a poet of genius to venture into it, as Chaucer ventured into the despised English of his day, and Dante into the Tuscan dialect, and Luther in his translation of the Bible into peasant German. Walt Whitman made a half-attempt and then drew back. Lowell, perhaps, also heard the call, but too soon. The Irish dialect of English, vastly less important than the American, has already had its interpreters, Douglas Hyde, John Millington Singhi, and Augusta Gregory and with what extraordinary results we all know. Here we have writing that is still indubitably English, but English, rid of its artificial restraints, and broken to the less self-conscious grammar and syntax of a simple and untutored folk. Singy, in his preface to the Playboy of the Western World, 
tells us how he got his gypsy phrases. Through a chink in the floor of the old Wicklow house where I was staying, that let me hear what was being said by the servant girls in the kitchen. There is no doubt, he goes on, that, in the happy ages of literature, striking and beautiful phrases were as ready to the storyteller's or the playwright's hand as the rich cloaks and dresses of his time. It is probable that when the Elizabethan dramatist took his inkhorn and sat down to his work, he used many phrases that he had just heard as he sat at dinner from his mother or his children. The result in the case of the Neo-Celts is a dialect that stands incomparably above the tight English of the grammarians. A dialect so naive, so pliant, so expressive, and adeptly managed, so beautiful that even purists have begun to succumb to it, and it promises to leave lasting marks upon English style. The American dialect has not yet come to that stage. In so far as it is apprehended at all, it is only in the sense that Irish English was apprehended a generation ago, that is, as something uncouth and comic. But that is the way the new dialects always come in, through a drumfire of cackles. Given the poet, there may suddenly come a day when our therns and woodahads will take on the barbaric stateliness of the peasant locutions of old Moria in Riders to the Sea. They seem grotesque and absurd today, because the folks who use them seem grotesque and absurd. But that is too facile logic, and under it is a false assumption. In all human beings, if only understanding be brought to the business, dignity will be found, and that dignity cannot fail to reveal itself soon or late in the words and phrases with which they make known their high hopes and aspirations, and cry out against the intolerable meaningless of life. End of chapter 9, part 3 End of the American Language by H. L. Mencken